Uh, I am really grateful for those of you who are here. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility as uh, those of you, and I see, I think nearly everyone, if not everyone in the, in the audience is recognizable to me. Uh, and I therefore know that all of you have been on similar pilgrimages uh, as the one that Bruce and our friend Tarak Koff just took to Okinawa. And we know that a great responsibility comes with those privileges. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to uh, discharge that responsibility a little bit. Um, I'm going to read much of what I have to say in hopes that that will preclude me missing a lot of important information that I want to pass along. I like this phrase, Nuchi Du Takara. Uh, it is the mantra that the Okinawan activists use. And I think, uh, to me, it's founded in their history, and it comes from their heart, and it is fundamental to their spirit. I wear this t-shirt, my Nuchi Du Takara t-shirt, not because or not just because I like the t-shirt, but it does prompt the question often, you know, what does that mean? And it gives me a chance to expound on those things that I want to talk about today. I know there are several of you here who have been to Okinawa in the past. This was the, I think, Bruce might correct me here, but I think this was the fourth delegation of Veterans for Peace activists that has gone there in the last several years. Tarak and Bruce have been, uh, they've assumed leadership roles in each of those delegations. Uh, Tarak, as you may know, is a longtime National Veterans for Peace director, and he has been, I think it's fair to say, the architect and the inspiration behind this initiative of Veterans for Peace. Uh, he has sponsored or led uh, or conceptualized a couple of trips to Jeju, a couple of trips to Okinawa, and uh, more than, I think, well, a couple anyway to the West, Point of, West uh, Bank of Palestine. Uh, and Bruce, as all of us know here, is perhaps the single activist, the activist who has most informed the general American public as to the excesses and the wages of our militarism. That's hardly an exaggeration. On this occasion, we went in response to a request for international support from leaders of the Okinawa Anti-Base Action Committee. Recent developments in Okinawa had convinced these men and women uh, that the time was crucial to the general movement to close U.S. air bases on Okinawa, but particularly were they focusing on the uh, relocation of a Marine Corps air station at Futenma to a place called Honoko, north of Futenma. The committee of the leaders had postulated that if citizens numbering four to 500 gathered in front of the gates during the period of time, April 23rd through the 28th, that they could definitely stop these convoys of uh, materials that were brought in, being brought into Hinoko to advance the project there. Uh, instrumental to the picture altogether has been Okinawa Governor Takeshi Onaga. Uh, we'll talk about him, I think, as we go along, but his role has really been critical. In 2014, he was elected as the governor of Okinawa with 100,000 majority uh, with a 100,000 voter majority. So he had great support, and that support was really based on his position in opposition to this relocation at, at Hanoko. So the activist leaders were called upon from around the world to join uh, in, in opposition to uh, what was happening at this, uh, at this location. Knowing something of Okinawa's geography and their history provides a necessary background uh, a context to enable an understanding of why they are so exercised about uh, our presence in their, on their island. So what follows over the next several slides is, a base, is basically just a primer. Okinawa is located about 400 miles south of the Japanese mainland and an equal distance from the Chinese mainland. Uh, the island itself is about 70 miles long by maybe seven miles wide. It has been part of the so-called Ryukyu Kingdom, or had been for several centuries leading up to 1879 when Japan annexed the island and made it one of its prefectures, one of its states. Its relative remoteness had dictated that those people had a different culture and a different language, very distinct from that of uh, the people on the Japanese mainland. And those distinctions determined that Okinawa would suffer lasting discrimination at the hands of the national government. Say, so please interrupt me if a, if a question arises through this. The consequences for being Okinawan really took a drastic turn during World War II. 
and have continued largely in large part ever since that time. <clears throat> in, in World War II, the Battle of Okinawa swept across the island, the Japanese having determined that they would make their stand there rather than on the Japanese mainland and thereby sparing those people on the mainland the devastation of a land invasion. So in the so-called Typhoon of Steel, 120,000 civilians of a population of about 460,000, maybe one in every four, were killed. During the post-war years, the U.S. confiscated many people's lands, perhaps displacing as many as 250,000 people on the island to make way for various bases that we constructed there. It's interesting that on April 28th in 1952, the Treaty of San Francisco was signed, ending the occupation of the Japanese mainland, but not of Okinawa itself. And so Okinawa remained under the control and the governance of the United States for the next uh, 20 or so years. And that date is observed to this day, April 28th, as the Day of Humiliation. It's a day that commemorates when the Okinawans became second-class citizens and have uh, continued to suffer that ignominy or that sort of treatment ever since. So today there remain 32 military bases on Okinawa. It's very much a symbol of the occupation or the colonization of that island. And it uh, sort of proves the absence of a truly independent and a democratic Japanese government. These, are, these give you an idea of the uh, disproportionate burden that Okinawa suffers relative to the Japanese mainland itself and the people there. So the Japanese, or the Okinawan public, really wants all the bases gone. They want them eliminated. This is the Tenma Air Base that's located in the middle of a central city called uh, Jinawan. It pop has a population of about 100,000. And of course, uh, uh, along with this picture that we see here goes a great deal of uh, a, a much hazard to the local population. It's ridiculous that an airport exists in such a, a populated area. So the US and Japan agreed that it ought to be relocated. And the problem is, though, there's no place on Okinawa that would be acceptable to the, Jap to the Okinawan people. <clears throat> The US and Japan national government decided regardless they would relocate to this place near Camp Schwab, an existing Marine Corps base. And uh, it would involve uh, landfill over the areas that you see delineated by the white lines here. And the construction project is now underway. It entails two V-shaped runways, as we see here. And it would require a landfill of about 375 acres of pristine waters and an investment of over $3 million. I'm sorry, B with a billion, with a, with a B, billion with a B. <clears throat> this, in my mind, is the poster child of desecration of environment, militarism, and the arrogance of empire. So this is the world that we inserted ourselves in on April 23rd. On that morning, we arrived at this gate, beyond which you can see the construction site, and across the street, on this central north-south highway, we found many of our kindred spirits with whom we would literally and figuratively link arms and, and uh, protest over the ensuing days. Many of them have been regular participants in what now is over, one, over a 5,000-day occupation in our presence, day and night. And this tented compound, several hundred yards away from the center of activity, which we'll see over the next several slides, it's a place for relief and respite from the elements and a place to sing and dance and eat and rest and share information and to strategize and to restore and to get inspiration. So that morning, walking down the street a few hundred yards away, we saw this. It's the first of the convoys that were arriving that day. Usually there were two or three such convoys and about 175 vehicles arriving uh, mostly carrying fill for the ongoing landfill project in the bay. And we greeted our fellow colleague, our colleagues with whom we would be spending a great deal of time over the following days. They'd already been seated for a couple of hours in as much as we had traveled from Naha City an hour and a half away and were joining them about two or three hours into their day. <clears throat> yes, they were predominantly elders, but there were an encouraging number of others. There were teenagers and college age folks and midlife and full-fledged full -fledged adults. 
we would learn through the week that the objective of the sustained presence of four to 500 protesters was met and surpassed. Busloads would come a daily on a, on a, a daily basis. They'd be coming from all over the island. And uh, we met many of the Japanese activists who had come down making the two hour flight from the mainland. Here you see Tarak and myself with uh, Doug Loomis. He's a former US Marine and an author and a scholar, a longtime Japan and Okinawan resident. He's written much about the situation there. He's a very engaged activist. He's been involved in the movement there for many, many years, and he's a member of the Veterans for Peace chapter there in Okinawa. He was our host and our translator. So many of the people who were seated there recognized Bruce and Tarak on our arrival. They knew us by our, the garb we were wearing, our Veterans for Peace costumes. And uh, we were greeted warmly, especially when Bruce and I unfurled this banner. So these next few slides, I hope, will give you a sense of the action and the atmosphere at the scene. In the intervals between the convoy's arrival, the crowd would build as protesters seated themselves in front of the construction entrance. The number of riot control police also would build as the hour of the convoy arrival neared. Often the protesters would be in place for hours. This time was put to good use as the leaders share the responsibility of keeping us engaged. There would be lectures and chants and songs and calisthenics. It was a great learning experience. In fact, the protesters referred to it as a college or a university. Um, <clears throat> they had a number of leaders, but they always shared with uh, the, those gathered there, I think, the, the, the uh, mic. This is one of the prominent leaders, the very prominent leader, um, uh, Hiroji Yamashiro. Hiroji Yamashiro. He's the charismatic director of the so-called Okinawa Peace Movement Center, and he seems indefatigable. He does it all, bringing an outside personality to the job, singing and lecturing and cajoling and entertaining and uh, prodding whatever it took. In October of 2016, Hiroji had been arrested for allegedly cutting a barbed wire fence around Camp Schwab and he endured six months in prison, never was uh, formally tried, and then was released. During that period of incarceration, he was denied medical treatment, denied visitations by family members, so his treatment was rather harsh. Uh, the disposition of his case has yet be de to be determined, but for the time being, he's back and has rejoined the fray in spite of the fact that he's in danger of being rearrested and uh, subject to even more draconian measures. Oh, here you see that Hiroji has uh, lent the mic to our delegation, to us Veterans for Peace. Speaking here is Tarak Koff, and he very emotionally, very emotionally expressed his love for the Okinawan people, as he was wont to do. And I think uh, he, uh, I uh, hate to suggest this, but he might have connected with the Okinawan people even more than Bruce has, simply because he lays his heart on, his heart is so uh, worn on his sleeve. Hiroji's situation, this leader, Hiroji, and his continued prominent role in the ongoing protest illuminates the curious nature of the dynamic between the riot control police and other authorities and the protesters. Even though Hiroji is at a heightened risk of being uh, re, uh, reincarcerated and subject to very serious consequences, should he be, every day he continues to play a very prominent role in what's happening there. And obviously he's respected by the uh, police force and even deferred to on occasions. It did, it did seem to me that it's a bit of a choreographed production. As long as everyone behaved within established norms, everything would be okay. We protesters were expected to adhere to nonviolent principles and the police would do the same. We would link arms and legs and within limits refuse to be carried away or to comply with their commands and they would physically remove us, yet rarely exceeding, in my opinion, the requisite force to pry us apart and separate each individual. They'd then haul us out one by one to a nearby holding area, carrying those of us who, were, who would not walk of our own accord. Here you might recognize this uh, ardent activist. I found this prevailing dynamic, anyway, between the uh, uh, the riot police and ourselves to be comforting and yet at the same time disturbing. Comforting because it seemed to me that there was really little risk of, uh, 
uh, that I would actually be physically harmed if I behaved myself and, and uh, acted within those established parameters. On the other hand, it was disturbing because I felt that our behavior, as long as we stayed within those norms, would be accepted and tolerated solely because they can continue with the, with the construction project at, the, at a pace that was acceptable to them. So I, I'm not trying to suggest that the dynamic was totally benign. There was plenty of intense emotion and there would inevitably be injuries or physical clashes when the, when the uh, <coughs> injuries when the physical clashes rose to a higher level. So injuries were not too uncommon. Now I've got a couple of very short videos that I hope I can operate without too much difficulty here. These couple of videos that I hope to show are only about a minute long and they do, I think, enable us to get a real sense of what the dynamic was like in the larger picture uh, on each of the occasions that the convoys arrived. Um, so this happened day after day after day, at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day. If the project is to continue uh, and to advance forward fast enough to satisfy the authorities and complete the project within an acceptable time, if they were only to rely on these truck deliveries, it would take some 46 years to bring all the film material in, the sufficient mater material to continue the project. So they're trying to transport, uh, and in fact have already begun transporting quarrying materials, fill materials from around the island, different points on the island, uh, a proposition that's in some cases requiring a couple of days of ship transport. So we went over to one of those sites on the west side of the island, about uh, 10 miles away from the Camp Schwab location, to impede the progress of that particular operation one day. And I've got a slide here that we hopefully may be able to see that I think sort of encapsulate, encapsulates uh, the, uh, the enormity of the crime being committed here. So this is just a minute long. What we're hearing is the riot police commanding their men as to what the next step is in terms of uh, removing us. It seems to be a, a matter of personal choice. I find it uh, sort of suggestive of the overall culture. You see many Oriental and Asian people wearing masks at the airports and elsewhere in the country. I think it's simply because of uh, uh, transfer of germs and uh, Okay, this gives you an idea of the transfer routes that uh, they were taking by way of ship delivery to Hinoko on the east side of the island. And you, Motobu, Motobu Bay is the area to which Bruce and I went in the last, uh, the last day or day before our last. This is that bay. It's another area that's relatively was a pristine area before it became desecrated by what's going on there. There's an open pit quarry just uh, a half a mile or so away from the harbor where we were located. We were in this parking area and we had joined other protesters in trying to impede this operation, truck delivery to the ships where they were downloading fill material to be brought around by way of sea. <clears throat> Here you see Bruce about to be hauled off. And this is a slide that I find suggestive and symbolic really of the entire uh, criminality of our role there. And that's the picture of, of of Aura Bay that I referred to earlier. So, I want to close with Nucci to Dakar, life is precious, right? Well, thank you very much. Any questions before we turn it over to Bruce? Suzanne? Yeah, yeah they've got it all. It's, uh, we were not never able to get access to the base, so I can't give you uh, a personal observation, but I suspect they've got every imaginable thing that our military people normally enjoy overseas. That base has been there for how many years? Decades, anyway, huh, Bruce? Um, 
So they're living in relative this is one comfort there. Right there um, 30, 32 military bases all over the country. Oh, so see. that's an important uh, issue. You know, we've, we occupy 20% of that island. The U.S. military occupies 20% occupies of the island. It's really an obscene occupation. It's just, it is impossible to dismiss the fact that they are very much, U.S. military personnel are very much in presence. There's some 50,000 military personnel on the island. And uh, did I say it covers 20%, those bases cover 20% of the island? <laughs> as far as I could tell, at the end of our visit there, at the end of the, the uh, plan for five or six day event, our uh, exaggerated effort, the leaders were satisfied that we had satisfactorily impeded progress on the project. I'm not so sure what the post-mortem was, how they felt about it since then. And I, I'm thinking Bruce may again be able to further enlighten us. Oh, well, I was, <coughs> will attempt to close with what I was going to say, if I had my notes available to me, is that on the last day, Bruce and I had the opportunity to walk up the highway about a mile or so outside of town, away from all the activity at the, at the gate. And we could look off across at Aura Bay, where this landfill operation is happening. We looked across the pr pristine um, terrain out into the pristine waters of Aura Bay. And we were well aware of the endangered species, the endangered coral out there, and the fact that this whole picture that we were looking at was doomed. And I had to ask myself as I wrote home in one of my dispatches that how can our leaders accept this sort of uh, uh, outrageous proposition? Here we're talking about a $3 billion project, and we're destroying the environment, and there seems to be really no defensible need for what's happening there. It's just... It is so disturbing, and frankly, as much as I embrace this notion of Nucci de Dakar, and I think that's, again, a very important mantra that they, that they find uh, uh, solace in, uh, I find it, I, I just found that in conclusion, I think uh, it's difficult to avoid despair. I just want to say what a pleasure it was to hang out with Doug Dud during this time, and Tarek, uh, and uh, also uh, Doug Loomis, who's really a wonderful human being. It was really a great thing. Uh, I, I think this uh, whole, whether we're talking about Jeju Island in Korea or talking about Okinawa, uh, I think it's really good to go back to the uh, Obama administration there. Uh, him and Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, the, they announced a pivot of U.S. military forces, 60% U.S. military forces into the Asia Pacific region in order to encircle Russia and China. Uh, they often use North Korea as the justification for th this uh, pivot, but North Korea is really, I think, a foil. They're not a military challenge to the United States in any kind of way, uh, but it's really about encircling Russia and China. And so because of this pivot, they need more barracks, they need more airfields, and they need more ports of call. And that's why on Jeju they build a Navy base, and that's why here they're building this twin runway on top of Aura Bay, necessitating millions and millions of dump truck loads of those big rocks at landfill to dump into the bay. We went out on a boat that uh, showed us 3,000-year-old blue coral in the water, uh, just a really a tragic, tragic uh, thought of how uh, the coral and the sea mammals called dugongs are going to be impacted uh, by this whole operation. On my first time we were there, we went for lunch one day to a little uh, town or village on Ora Bay, and we went to the community hall, a room about this size, and there were chairs and tables set up in a big square. And uh, they served us lunch. And then they spoke to us. We spoke to them. And on the way out, when we were getting on our bus, one of them, one of the older women said to me, what are you going to do when you go home? Because, you know, it's nice for you guys to come here and everything else. But what are you really going to do about it? And it was at that point, to be honest with you, when I came home that I said uh, that I've got to do more. I've got to really step it up, step up my own personal level of commitment and also step up my 
uh, organizing. And that's when I began to really uh, promote these uh, protests at Bath Ironworks uh, with the, the civil disobedience at the christenings, and which we've done too now. Uh, and uh, so it just really felt like that nothing is going to change for the people there and nothing is going to change for the people in Korea or anywhere else in the world where the United States is doing things unless we step it up here. And, you know, I hear a lot of my friends say, well, yeah, but Bruce, you know, I'm getting old, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can't do things anymore. But there were people in wheelchairs, disabled, disabled people uh, at this protest, blocking the gate, being hauled away by the police. There was a 95-year-old woman there that's been one of the leaders of the movement for years. And so I, and all kinds of uh, a lot of uh, other people, uh, mostly older people. And uh, so, you know, my feeling is, uh, is that uh, the great uh, uh, movement lawyer, attorney, William Kunstler, once said, age is not a ticket out of the struggle. That when the alarm bells clang, we've all got to be there, uh, at, you know, at the blockades, so to speak. So for me, that was a real important moment, the, the words from this older woman. Uh, I can tell you that also on a previous time I was there, Okinawan people told us this story that when Obama was president, his ambassador to Japan, someone who I think you all have heard of, Caroline Kennedy, uh, she uh, was going to Okinawa from the mainland of Japan and the Okinawan people that are organizing these protests asked for a meeting with Caroline Kennedy to discuss the situation and she refused to meet with them. So this is not an Obama thing, I mean, excuse me, a Trump thing or, you know, a Republican thing. This is a two-party thing here. Both parties are totally committed to this pivot and to this domination of the region and the use of Okinawa or Jeju Island or any other place there as a forward deployed offensive military operations center. One thing we heard uh, very dramatically on our last night uh, when we were in Okinawa before we left, uh, we went to dinner, Doug, uh, Doug Loomis, uh, Dud, Tarek, and myself, and a woman by the name of Sunshine. Uh, she's a school teacher, a really effervescent personality. Her name matches her personality quite well, but she's a real dedicated resistor. Uh, one day while we were there, earlier in the week, they had a, a special emphasis on the kayak portion of the protest, because every day they have kayaks in the water trying to get into this area where they're dumping all of this landfill in the water. And on this particular day, they had 83 people in kayaks, 83 kayaks that day. And she was one of those that was able to break through past the uh, Japanese Coast Guard security perimeter that they have and was able to actually get near this big dredging machine. And actually, uh, they had to shut it down momentarily while she was in that area. So she was feeling good about it. But anyway, she came to dinner with us on that last night, and she told us stuff that uh, nobody else had really told us during the week, some of the internal uh, debates going on and controversies going on within the movement. And the key point was that there's a big debate going on right now about Governor Onaga. You saw his picture in the beginning. He's up for re-election in the fall, and he's very much opposed to the uh, base. Uh, it, but a lot of people are worried because in, in recent, uh, the last year or so, there have been a series of mayoral elections. All the mayors of all the major cities across Okinawa were all opposed to the base. But the U.S. in Tokyo started a campaign to replace all of those mayors with people that would be more compliant on the U.S.-Tokyo agenda. Yeah, you might call that collusion. And so they've been successful now at replacing every single one of the mayors except for one left, all right? And they've been doing it by various means, but mostly in a massive infusion of money, high-tech American-style campaigns, manipulative advertising, and everything else. 
And so now they're going to go after the governor. And they found a candidate, apparently a wealthy guy, that has uh, been holding free events for hundreds of thousands of, of uh, people to come. And he brings in a, a famous bands from the mainland of Japan. He brings in comedians and other such entertainers. And they put on these big shows that attract all these people. And with his name on it, right, because he's, you know, he's paying for these. And he's, he's likely to be the candidate that's going to run against the governor. So he's building his name recognition and everything else. As they kind of depoliticize, they're trying to depoliticize the coming generation uh, and uh, as a way to uh, defeat these, uh, these incumbent politicians. Uh, just a few days ago, on, I think it was May 12th, uh, they had a 3,500 person protest. So the, what we saw while we were there, five, six, 700 people, is really not anything near as big as they had in just in recent days. So they're really uh, continuing with the protests and uh, they will continue to do so. 15 years of daily protest started, they started out in the water, most of their protests were, because the uh, Japanese government erected these scaffolding in the water where they were taking uh, samples of the, of the seabed. Uh, th there's also information saying that the seabed is like a sponge out there. And when you put this massive weight of these runways on top of it, some engineers are predicting that the seabed is going to give way because Okinawa is a lot of caves. And uh, apparently under the water are a lot of caves. And so when you put that kind of weight, there's going to be a collapse, many people believe, of the runway. So anyway, they had these scaffolding out there where they were taking these readings of, of the seabed. And so the people would go out on the kayaks and climb on top of the scaffolding. Uh, I showed a video maybe five, six, seven years ago at our house one time uh, of this action. A couple of you might have been there. You might remember it. But they would climb, the, the people would take their kayaks and go out and climb the scaffolding. And then the Japanese uh, uh, Coast Guard and military would come out and pull them away, pull them off, throw them in the water. And so this went on for a long, long time. So that was the first level of resistance that uh, they've been doing. And it's been going on now, again, daily for 15 years. Just imagine if I was to come to you all today and said, let's start having a daily protest at Bath Ironworks. Daily. How many of you would actually be able to come or would come? Or, I mean, not likely, right? But so the, the level of commitment with these folks is beyond anything I've ever seen. And uh, anybody that goes to these places is deeply touched uh, by the whole experience. Well, let me stop there and see if anybody has any questions or comments. What, what if anything has appeared in the media in Okinawa? The Okinawan uh, media has been good. They've been providing lots of uh, stories. They've covered veterans for peace repeatedly. When we've gone there, television, uh, you see all the Okinawan meeting at these protests every day, they're there. Uh, so, but that's not the problem. The problem is on the mainland. On the mainland, uh, the media in mainland Japan doesn't cover this at much at all. And in fact, most people on the mainland of Japan don't know anything about what's going on in Okinawa. It's like far away and they, you know, they don't really know anything about it. So that's one of the problems. So while, while we were there, we met several people from the mainland and the boat we went on, for example, there was a man who brought a handful of other, uh, other peace activists from the mainland of Japan. So people are continually bringing people from the mainland to come and uh, be part of the effort there at the gate uh, and, and educating them so they go home and teach people back on the mainland about what's happening uh, there. And slowing it down, obviously, yeah. by their blockades uh, because we experienced our, on our first day there about a three-hour delay. Uh, you know, with the trucks lined up, you saw the line of trucks there in the pictures. And it took about three hours before they, they got in there because of all the people that were blocking. The next day, it 
appeared to me that they brought in more police and they cut that to about an hour and a half to clear it out and let the trucks roll through. But uh, day in and day out, they are slowing the operation down. I'm sure it's costing the uh, Japanese government a lot of money. The United States has very graciously uh, uh, forced the Japanese government to pay for this project the way we forced the Korean government to pay for the Navy base on Jeju Island. And so, uh, but, uh, but clearly they need this ship delivery to circumvent the, uh, the, the slowing down tactics of the people. It, actually, it was the government. Uh, the government, the Korean, South Korean government was fining the village and, and, and like a hundred of the top leaders of the Jeju protest. Uh, but the village elders, the village government itself, they were fining them for the delays, the construction delays. And it was a huge amount of money. And people were really frightened about it. Uh, uh, but when the new uh, President Moon was recently elected, he uh, got the government to drop the, drop the fines. So that's been washed away. You know, it's amazing because we've on a couple of the trips, we've gone back and forth and back and forth here and there. Somebody wants us, because you know, they want us to come to one base to protest early in the morning and go to another place. So we were running back and forth a lot. And so as you drive along the highways there, it's just unbelievable what you see. Base after base after base, Marines, Army, Air Force, Marines, Army, Air, I mean, it's literally like that, you know. And, uh, and you see, you know, the, the housing area just off the side of the road, you know, the big barbed wire fence, and then there's a housing area, and everybody living in their American single home uh, houses with yards and all that kind of thing. And then across the street on the other side, you see the Okinawans living in, you know, uh, high-rise apartments with no yard or anything like that. So, I mean, just... And, and just imagine that every day you're looking at this uh, and you're seeing it, it builds up the resentment like crazy. We went to a museum on our first trip. One of the former governors uh, had a museum and uh, I'll, I'll never forget going up this hallway to a, a second or third floor and there was this string kind of like in here with these pictures, the string of pictures of protests every year on Okinawa starting in 1952 every single year to the present. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I never heard of any of this. I never heard this reported at all. You know, we would never know that these people have been on top of this every year for all these years. You'd never, you'd never have a clue. Ryuku Kingdom, they were a, a separate kingdom with their own language. They were a peaceful trading uh, kingdom. They, they traded with China and Taiwan and Japan and everybody else in the area, in the region. And, since World War II, and then they were occupied they were by the... Put under the Japanese government. Yeah, before the war, uh, they were occupied for many years and then the war and then we took over after that. So before but, the war, it was Japanese doing it. Right, right. But so we've given it back to Japanese. Yeah, now it's been reverted back to Japan. And uh, first, we, after the war, the United States controlled it. And uh, so the people, the Okinawan people, demanded that they be reverted back to Japan because they thought, well, at least it's closer. You know, Tokyo's closer than Washington. We can maybe have more input, you know. And so it was reverted back to uh, Japan, but they don't feel like anything has really changed for them. So they, they, they're, they're pretty frustrated. Oh, there are, but uh, the United States doesn't give a damn and doesn't listen. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, there are all kinds of experts like that uh, trying to help and, and getting the information out there. Uh, there's a woman in uh, Hawaii that is a famous uh, coral specialist. In fact, on our... Uh, on the table over here is a Global Network newspaper. I have an article from her uh, about uh, what the Navy's doing in the Hawaii area around coral and everything. So uh, she's been trying to help Jeju Island. She's been trying to help Okinawa. 
So yeah, there. But uh, U.S. ignores. You know, U.S. doesn't give a damn about all that stuff. There's lawsuits against uh, the U.S. in San Francisco and federal court. But yeah, they bring their families. They live on the base. They uh, they go to school on the base, and uh, it's a very isolated existence. And they think it's wonderful. You know, they have. Usually the U.S. military has the best beaches on, you know, uh, around. Uh, they think it's fantastic. So, uh, you know, it's a great thing. Uh, in the airport, you know, when you're flying in and out, you see all these GIs with their families. And, uh, you know, they're, they think it's fantastic. They're in a wonderful, you know, island paradise in the Pacific. They think it's great. And they, they're told... Uh, I, was, I, I heard this twice, that the GIs are told that these are just a few protesters, that the majority of people support the base, which is not true. It's 85, 90 percent of the people are opposed to the base on Okinawa. But they're also told that the protesters are given a daily stipend by China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we heard that. I heard that twice. You might have seen a picture of a young Buddhist monk sitting in the front of one of the, he told me that, that he met some GI and the GI invited him on the base for lunch. And he went on the base, they had lunch together. And the GI told him this, you know, we're told by the US military that you guys are all paid by China. Is that true? He said, no, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And on my previous trip, uh, before this one that we just went on, uh, a U.S. military army helicopter was flying over a, basically a kindergarten, and a door from the helicopter, or a window, I think it was, fell out and landed in the middle of the playground, and kids were on the playground at the time. So these kind of things, the accidents, uh, these kind of things happen routinely. Uh, when I was there on a previous trip, there was an old man driving in one of these tiny little small pickup trucks, just these little tiny things, and a drunken GI was driving some military vehicle and crashed into him and killed the old man. So the, the, uh, rapes and murders happen frequently at the hands of the US GIs. And so people are just fed up with it. They're just, they're tired of it. The noise is unbelievable because when you have all these different military operations with trucks and planes and helicopters, it's just endless noise. And uh, we went to, uh, on our first trip that we did together, we, they took us to a guy's house right across the street from the U.S. Air Force Base. And... Uh, he was telling us that at 2 and 3 in the morning, you can't sleep because the planes are taking off and landing and racing their engines and everything else. And it's just endless noise always. And so they filed lawsuits uh, in Tokyo opposing the noise and asking for, uh, you know, in some countries, this story came out just recently, one of the uh, Japanese media did a story comparing how much uh, is called Status of Forces Agreement, SOFA. The United States signs an agreement with the host country, and they have rules. And so they compared Italy, Germany, and Okinawa, and Japan, the rules of the SOFA in each of those three countries. And Okinawa and Japan have the weakest rules. In Italy... The United States is not allowed to make noise with airplanes after like 10 o'clock at night. But in Okinawa and Japan, there's no, no time limits whatsoever. And so there's a whole series of these kind of differences between the white European SOFA agreements with Italy and Germany and the Okinawan and Japanese ones. For example, the, if there's a, a contamination and a plane accident on one of the bases, the Japanese or Okinawans are not allowed to go on the base to investigate to see what kind of environmental problem there is, while in Germany and Italy, they're allowed to. So they feel additionally discriminate, discriminated against uh, because of these uh, unfair rules. 
The United States and NATO are expanding from regular Europe, I guess you'd say old Europe, into what's called New Europe, what used to be the Warsaw Pact, the former Soviet Union, into Poland, Lithuania, Romania, Latvia, Estonia, all those places. The U.S. and NATO are expanding into, into those regions, building bases, encircling Russia the same way that China is being encircled from the other side, uh, from the, you know, the Pacific region. And also Russia is being encircled from that side too. I, I heard a story that I, I, that I never forgot. During the Korean War, General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, he's fighting in, you know, in Korea during the Korean War, and he wants to drag Russia into the war. And he's told by Washington, no, we're not going to do that. And so he sends, without any uh, permission, U.S. bombers from probably bases, either air, uh, aircraft carriers that our dear friend Tom Sturdivant worked on during the Korean War, or U.S. military bases in Okinawa. My dad was stationed during the Korean War in Okinawa, and they had uh, bomber bases there in Okinawa that they would fly and bomb Korea. So anyway, U.S. bombers from any, any number of those uh, possibilities flew to Vladivostok, just over the border of North Korea, bombed Vladivostok, Russia, trying to draw Russia into the war. Russia didn't take the bait, and eventually uh, 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 Douglas MacArthur was fired. Uh, and I think this probably was one more incident that led to his eventual sacking uh, by Truman at the time. Uh, so clearly the encirclement of Russia and China today is, uh, is going on uh, by the U.S. military, and it's not just happening here in the Pacific, but it's happening also on the, uh, on the uh, western side of, uh, of, the, of the Russian Federation today on their borders. Very few. Do you know the number? Well, recently they've created, I think, one or two new bases uh, in, the, uh, in the Pacific, in the ocean, you know, on, right. on little islands. Uh, and I heard they had a base uh, uh, in Ty uh, Tibet. Uh, Tibet. Tibet. Uh, I heard they had a base there. So maybe they have three bases or four bases outside of their country. So China maybe five, Russia maybe, I think that they might have five because we know they have at least two in Syria. I think in, in the stands, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, one of those, one or two bases there. So Russia might have, let's say five. And then we have, we know for sure they have 800 in the United States, but possibly even more depending on how you count them and how you, how you name them. So there's no uh, comparison at all. I think in you hear that? Third, David Vine says in his book, Base Nation, on the table back there, that the whole world total has 35 bases outside of, other than, other, than, other than our bases. Other than us. Other than us, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my own opinion uh, is that there's no substitute for hard work. <laughs> and uh, there's no way out except through. So we are stuck with this reality that we're dealing with today. Our government is a renegade, capitalist, warmongering government that is eating up our national resources, resources destroying social progress in this country. That's why... Bigger. I, I, I would say this, just to add on to that, is that in Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, remember he was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, he was the one that bragged that he uh, uh, found uh, Barack Obama when he was a student at Columbia, Brzezinski was teaching at Columbia, he discovered Obama and they brought him in and uh, made him president. Um, but in his book, Grand Chessboard, he talks about this very thing, that whoever controls 
this, this region that uh, Regis just des described is going to control the world, uh, that they will be, you know, essentially in the driver's seat, and that we must have our military bases throughout that part of the world, and uh, it would be an enormous expense for the American taxpayers. And Brzezinski went on to say that without a Pearl Harbor-like event, it was in the United States, it was un unlikely that the American people would ever make such a commitment. Richard Pearl and... PNAC, the oh, Project okay. for a New American yeah. Century. Anyway, no, 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 it was. It was Brzezinski. Brzezinski said it first in his book, oh. and, then, and then the Project for a New American okay. Century, PNAC, they picked up on it. And so again, I think what I'm, the point I want to make is that there is a, a confluence of interests here between, we think of Brzezinski, we think of the Democratic Party, we think of PNAC, we think of the Republican Party, but we, what we see here is within the ruling class of this country, a confluence of strategic interest when it comes to the future uh, of uh, U.S. military and economic policy around the world. So I think this is a key. But in the end, let me say this. In the end, I don't think that our solution is going to come from a democratic process. In the old days, what we thought by voting or educating members of Congress or discussing things with Angus King or something like that, it's not going to come from that because the ruling oligarchy that runs this country and a lot of the world, they now have locked the system down and they don't intend to open it back up. And I think the only way that we're going to be able to have any effect is to really follow the model of the people on Jeju Island and Okinawa and move into a dedicated level of resistance that we in the peace movement have never imagined before for ourselves. Okay, that standing on a corner with a sign that says peace on it ain't going to cut it anymore. It's not going to do it. And we've got to move to a new strategic discussion within our groups where we talk about what's it really going to take and how are we going to get there. And knowing that most likely we're not going to see any real resolution in our lifetimes. But just as the people that are protesting daily for 15 years, they're not concerned about, uh, am I going to see resolution tomorrow? What they're concerned about is, if there's a war between the United States and Russia and China, we are dead. Because this island is prime target for a nuclear strike. Jeju Island, prime target for a nuclear strike. We are dead. And so we are literally fighting, they're saying, for our lives and our children's lives and for nature's life. That's what we're doing. And we in this country, I think, uh, forgive me for being so bold, but we're half-stepping. We're half-stepping.